Welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show, where we take a deep dive into the wonderful world of psychology and mental wellbeing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of the Mental Wellbeing Show. In today's episode, we are diving into a new age view of resilience with Dr. Philip Jeffries, a psychologist and research fellow at Dalhousie University in Canada. In today's episode, we take a deep dive into resilience from a really important and innovative view. In particular, Phil takes us through some of the research looking at why it's so important to recognize and augment the social and community factors that someone is is embedded in when looking at improving their own resilience in response to adversity. We also dive into when resilience can become toxic and Phil takes us through some of his research-backed advice on how you can improve your own resilience without heaping too much pressure upon yourself. If today's episode or any of the other episodes of the Mental Wellbeing Show have indeed brought value to your life, I would be super grateful if you were to hit subscribe or follow. This is how I continue to grow the Mental Wellbeing Show and have what I think are some pretty cool conversations steeped in the evidence, but also in practical strategies with global mental well-being experts. Thanks everyone for tuning in and I hope you enjoy today's episode with Dr. Phil Jeffries on a new age view of resilience. All right, Dr. Phil Jeffries, welcome to the Mental Wellbeing Show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you on. We're going to be talking all things resilience, but not in the way I think many people would um, think of resilience in. At least that was certainly my um, interpretation after reading through your research. My prior kind of interpretation of resilience was that it's primarily this individual construct about strength, determination, grit, things like that. But it seems like that's not really the full picture. So can you tell us a little bit about um, what resilience is in a more kind of holistic sense? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think, if, you know, what you said about your original ideas about what resilience is, this individual construct about grit, sort of hardiness, perhaps, that's fair enough. I think that's uh, that's what a lot of people kind of immediately what kind of comes to mind. And actually, kind of historically, in the research, that's what it was sort of equated with as well. Like it was this kind of like grit perseverance you know like what helps people kind of get through this to do with them and their kind of personality and some kind of magical quality but i think you know a lot of us nowadays are taking a more as you say holistic view kind of thinking about other factors especially those in an individual's environment right so rather than kind of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps it's about all the other kind of important things around you that might help you get through that kind of trouble and that's another thing to say that like when you think of resilience like when that kind of comes to mind it's typically in the context of some kind of adversity if that's like a major life event or a stressor or something like that so you know resilience like what's helping you to manage that to kind of like get back to maybe where you were or to cope with it or to kind of overcome it like what are those kinds of factors that are helping you through on that kind of positive trajectory which can be things to do with your personality or things about you, but also probably things in your kind of environment as well. Mm. So what are some of those kind of environmental factors that do play a part uh, in someone's response to adversity, stresses, and, and in their overall resilience? Well, you know, we got, I think, first of all, you've got to be kind of careful that you aren't just saying, look, there's this kind of set of, magical factors that apply to every individual and every kind of adversity they go through right so like clearly there are a few things which are generally good to have in your lives like having kind of a peer support network is always useful you know you go through some kind of like traumatic issue you go through something i don't know bereavement um or maybe it's some other kind of disaster that's experienced having others that you can like take the time to speak with or who are there to kind of support you is always going to be you know important it that's something which is probably for the majority of adversity kinds that are out there it's it's going to be generally protective 
But I mean, there's a whole host of other kinds of factors, some of which are going to be more important than others, right? So, I mean, you, when we talk about adversity, we're talking about things like, I don't know, it can be things like pretty nasty things that happen to you, exams and like real kind of like stressful events to natural disasters. So, you know, if you experience a natural disaster, like one of those kind of protective factors might be how your community kind of responds or like how, what kind of uh, things have been put in place already. Like, you know, if there's a tsunami on the horizon or something going on there, it's like how prepared was your community? Where did they have the correct signage? Or was that kind of like, um, uh, you know, had the kind of a, an emergency evacuation being sort of uh, established and shared with individuals? You know, all those kinds of things will help uh, individuals to kind of manage that and the response after in, in the wake of, that kind of uh, incident yeah so it seems like it's very context dependent and what might be protective and promotive of resilience in one context and culture even is different compared to others i imagine i think so you know like we would do a lot of cross-cultural research and we were like one of our studies was looking at sort of protective factors in um in different uh, countries around the world you know looking at what young people kind of draw on and how those kind of interact with each other and yeah it's i I mean it's you get more kind of collectivist cultures or where you know the community is more important there's more of a kind of prioritization compared to say somewhere like uh, the us or other places where the individual is kind of paramount and that's sort of most important you know in those kind of situations um it's uh you can get individuals depending on different things to a different extent, different protective factors, right? So, you know, um, one thing that has been sort of noted in the research, which is linked to a kind of like a a sense of self-concept and sort of self-promotion is, you know, having pride in one's achievements and, you know, things you've done in the past where you're able to kind of reflect on those and think, you know, I did a good job there. You know, what I'm doing is good and that can sort of there's a kind of a self-confidence associated with that and we kind of found that that would be more important in more kind of western individualist kind of countries whereas some of the other uh, countries which are involved in our research you know that was less important compared to sort of community relationships that you know the things that you did that were in service of the community um or that you did with others were kind of uh, prioritized uh, more highly so it's um yeah I, I think you know when we talk about kind of individual resilience there's definitely um places where you know support from others and the way you receive that it does kind of vary yeah yeah it's a it's a very interesting concept and i'm curious as well as to why perhaps it's only really catching on now or why traditionally, you know, like you said in the research, resilience was primarily this kind of individual construct and and why things are changing and, and why perhaps we're recognizing more the the uh, value of the, the broader context and environmental factors. Do you have any kind of thoughts as to why that's kind of catching up now? Yeah, um, I suppose it's like resilience like it's becoming you know dare i say kind of fashionable um it's kind of it's quite in vogue at the moment like a lot of people talk about uh, the importance of resilience and i think there's a sort of that's a natural progression that i see from things like talking about well-being and you know um having kind of good mental health which is always there and it's always in it's important right um, but when you've got sort of um, national initiatives or maybe employee drives with organizations, like they've had the kind of the wellness movement and that was, you know, focused on very much on like, you know, what can we do to boost our employees' mental health and their well-being or individuals within, you know, students and universities, like what can we do to support our students, make sure their mental health is okay. And I think there's been a natural kind of like, move to resilience which still involves that it's still like a lot of the time it's about how can we support and build our you know the the individuals that we are involved in our organization students or what have you you know about building and sustaining their mental health but it's also in recognition 
of the kind of adversities they face, right? Which just seem to be, you know, coming up more and more. Like we we just had like the COVID pandemic, so a lot there's a lot of kind of um, uh, so a lot of kind of talk about sort of building resilience in response to that or like adapting, um, and it's you know other things like the the cost of living, which uh, lots of kind of countries are being plagued with at the moment, and like how young people are supposed to, uh, you know, face this kind of uncertain job market, you know, a lot of jobs which are disappearing. Um, it's hard to get into kind of certain kind of workforces, especially with kind of like the rise of AI, you know, throwing a lot of uncertainty forward. It's like, how can we be resilient to this kind of uh, stress and uncertainty and manage that moving forward? So, you know, it's not just like, how can we kind of keep our mental health good? Well, it's like, how do we, how do we build our resilience, which is uh, going to help to um, recover or sustain our mental health in response to this? It's almost, it's almost like a wraparound concept, if you like, or something which is more kind of dynamic that takes into account these particular stresses that we might be facing. Yeah, okay, right. So it's almost like a, an extension of the the recognition of the societal kind of influences on mental health it's kind of extending out to resilience now and the environmental and societal kind of influences there yeah i think so it's um mm. if you take um any kind of example like uh poverty or something like that it's like you know we can do lots to um uh, try to alleviate these kinds of issues but like we can't easily overcome them and there'll always be maybe something else on the horizon or something related so it's like how can you kind of like build resilience to try to maximize an individual's well-being or their mental health in those kinds of contexts which you have to be kind of careful there as well that you aren't not addressing the problem as well like in situations of work or like even, you know, university or something, you still get kind of concepts of like burnout and things like that. So you have to be careful that people aren't pushing resilience to say, well, you guys just need to be able to deal with this better. You know, here's this kind of skills, here's this kind of information, and we're going to build your resilience, but you're still kind of faced with the same level of adversity, you know. So it's still important to kind of make efforts to try to address those adversities where possible and also not just to load everything onto the individual to say you know here are all these things that you can do to make things better for yourself um you know go off and sort yourself out and come back and everything will be rosy you know like building resilience more and more of the research is saying that this is it's a real shared enterprise right it involves a lot of the kind of important social factors you know, which range on loads of different levels. Like we talked about kind of, you know, peer support is kind of an obvious one, which is commonly important, but things like, you know, where you live and factors of about where you live, like, you know, your neighborhood and your kind of interactions with say, you know, people in your area or your just your general perception. If you live in kind of like a, a risky kind of area where, you know, you're kind of always on edge, like these, all these things can kind of, play a part into like your general well-being if, even if it's just kind of subtle but can also in certain circumstances be protective to certain kinds of adversity as well you know so there's different kinds of layers as well and we also find that like some people depending on again depending on the kind of adversity will may draw on you know kind of cultural factors as well like things about say their heritage lineage they may kind of draw and it may buffer them against certain kinds of stresses as well so you know there's a whole kind of slew of these factors that are beyond just these very kind of individual skills or what your personality is like in terms of say whether mm. you can deal with something or not deal with something yeah so on that point then what you're kind of mentioning feel in the sense of like putting resilience and the onus on the individual and, and not recognizing the broader kind of context around them. Can, can resilience promotive interventions or, you know, treatments where you look to promote someone's resilience purely from an individual perspective ever actually cause be toxic or, you know, uh, cause more of a mental strain upon, upon someone? 
I think there's definitely that possibility. Like if you take it to its logical extreme, it is kind of unfair, you know, like say you've got a lot of students in your university that are kind of really stressed out and you say, look, here are these mindfulness exercises, you know, here are these meditation exercises, you know, go for a run and that kind of thing. And all should be great afterwards. And like, a lot of these kinds of like little sort of steps and pieces should contribute like somewhat to helping an individual to manage whatever kind of adversity or stress they might be facing. Maybe if their mental health is low, it is maybe going to help to start building their resilience a little bit more. But, you know, it's it would be a little unfair to load it all on the individuals that way. So there may be, you know, a certain degree of improvement, but I think the best kind of improvement works when there is um, sort of, uh, you get those sort of other kinds of power bases, other kinds of structures involved as well. So, you know, it's like taking things apart and thinking like, what is really causing this kind of adversity in the first place? Is that something we can do something about? Like if it is a load of stress that's coming from exams all at this time, then it's like, well, you know, what can we maybe do to lessen the burden there? Is there anything that we can do that, uh, you know, in, as an organization as well, you know, um, which is there's there's a sort of a related point as well there that, uh, you know, organizations can put out support services and they can just say, here's something which will kind of like support our individuals. But it may not be approachable. It may not be done in, um, you know, in a way that like, you know, people want to use. Like you put a, you have your sort of like, I don't know, your your individual, your, your counselor or someone like that. And it's on university premises and they've got a big sign on the door saying, you know, counselor here. And it's right on like the main thoroughfare for everyone walks past. And a lot of people like won't want to access that because, you know, they've got that kind of, Maybe there's something about self-stigmatizing that might be going on if they are seen going in there and they don't want to be seen and they maybe equate that with maybe a sign of weakness or something like that. But, you know, there's just there's ways where individuals won't use that service or that kind of support which is being put out there, even though it might be, you know, the intentions might be good behind it, but it's just not being delivered in a way which is really suitable to um, to those to uh to the individuals who might use it so you know that's another thing is that these kind of protective factors that might be associated with resilience like maybe support from organizations they have to be kind of put out there in ways that are appropriate to the individual whether that's culturally appropriate socially appropriate or you know it's relevant as well mm. just thinking of kind of examples as well of how sometimes i share um the importance of other external factors involved in resilience, right? Um, so, you know, there, there's a few kind of examples to draw on, a few kind of case studies. Um, but like you see it after you sort of like start to look out for these things, um, you really start seeing it everywhere, right? So like a, there's a lot of celebrities out there, a lot of people who will put out their stories about how they work super hard to get where they were and they their successes are due to their kind of hard efforts and they overcome kind of adversity in the backgrounds they kind of came from and that's not denying like the struggles they kind of experienced it's not to deny that they put in a lot of effort but sometimes when you look a little bit more into those individual stories you get to see that there were other individuals um involved you know there's uh I mean, like, you know, someone like Ed Sheeran, you know, that hit, like he would share stories about how he played gigs um, all over the place. You know, he busked and he'd be playing them on the street and all kinds of stuff. And he was just trying to get noticed and just trying to get recognized. And he'd be playing these tiny little gigs and doing absolutely all he could. And this went on for a long, long time. Um, and then, you know, uh, there are other people that eventually kind of reached out and gave him a bit of airplay. And I think Taylor Swift, like, gave him a bit of a, a leg up at one point as well. So, you know, these kind of moments when other people sort of step in and see an individual then help to kind of propel them further, you know, in Ed Sheeran's case, it's kind of into the stratosphere, you know, really kind of taking off. Whereas, 
you know, somebody else might be putting out a similar like level of quality and whatever they're doing, working super hard. And it, you know, you can be playing all the kind of gigs you want on every street corner that you can find, but like you may not ever get to the next level and without that kind of leg up, you know, it's like um, another story that uh, one of my colleagues likes to tell is, you know, the example of Cinderella as well. So Cinderella experiencing all the kind of adversity that you can imagine, you know, real hardship, you know, put to work and suffer, locked away in the basement. Um, and, you know, she's kind of working hard, getting by, persevering, pulling out all the stops, the grit, all of these sort of personality aspects that might be associated with resilience. But the thing that actually sort of makes things work out in the end for her is the sort of it's the fairy godmother that sort of steps in and says, look, we'll get you to the ball. You know, here's the carriage, here's the clothes. We'll sort you out. We'll put you in that position where then you can take the next step yourself. You know, you can excel and win over the prince and live happily ever after. You know, it's just, obviously it's quite a, um, a pithy example. It's, um, it's just a fairy tale, but even then just uh, an example that, you know, somebody can, they can commit and they can put in the effort themselves and those kinds of things. But it's that interaction and often the support from others that uh, that really help you to kind of get to the next level to really sort of overcome um, whatever kind of adversity you're facing. In terms of interactions, um, you know, that's a really cool couple of examples that you show there with Cinderella and Ed Sheeran. And I was reflecting on how these individual factors and environmental factors interact in my own life. And I have what we call an avoidant attachment style. So I'm less likely to reach out for help, to uh, show vulnerability to people around me. And even if I know I need help, less likely to actually ask for it from the social support around me. So I can see how that might interact in a way that I might get less social support if I am less likely to reach out for it because of the individual factor. So I suppose my question is, is kind of how else do, you know, these individual and environmental factors play out? Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Like, especially I think with younger people, there is like a desire to kind of sort things out yourself. And, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and yeah, like we don't always have to say, turn to other people and pour our heart out to them, or we don't have to have like a access to therapists and things like that. Like these kinds of things can be useful, but they're not the be all and end all. Um, you know, so our research would look at, you know, the import, some of the importance of other kinds of resources in your environment as well. You know, people they play a part. It's important that it's, it's good to have others to kind of talk to and to turn to, even if you don't ultimately use them, just having individuals that you think that you could turn to can sort of be important in its own way. But so too are it are some of these other kinds of resources, like for instance, um, maybe being part of communities or organizations, and, you know, if you have a pastime, like you, you play team sports or something like that, or you go to the gym or you play video games or whatever, you might have your kind of community there. And again, these might not be people that you kind of talk to about your problems, but it's just having that kind of social elements of just a place uh, where you can go to or people that you can be around that make you feel like a little bit better as well, you know, um, and that might extend to other kind of places as well. So, you know, one of the activities that we kind of do when we're, we can do a kind of what we call like a resource mapping exercise where we might sort of identify some of these external things in your life and your environment that you might be able to draw on. So we might be able to sort of thinking about people, figures that you have, whether they're family or other individuals that you might be turning to, um, but places and they, it might be like nature, you know, we know that nature has a kind of restorative, very kind of like therapeutic effect. So are there places that are accessible to you nearby that you either use or could use um, 
that you might be able to go to to sometimes feel just that little bit better you know you're a bit kind of stressed a bit kind of burnt out is there a park that you can go to spend a little bit of time there um you know or another kind of like a location like that and for some people that works really well you know for others that's like that's not really their thing so they might be thinking of like the shopping mall or that or the skate park or something you know there might just be a kind of an, another environment that you can go to that you might be able to just feel a little bit better there's maybe a little bit of like catharsis or distraction that's involved in these places and so using them in kind of moderation is useful just thinking about these different places that you might be able to draw on you know and it's just all that's trying to do is to give a little bit of balance against this idea that if you're really down stressed dealing with a problem you don't just sit in your room and try and think your way out of it you don't just try to use positive affirmations to just you know pull yourself up by your bootstraps out the door again i'm 100 percent, you know so it's like well you know what can i do and even thinking about like um uh, how you might be going about your life as well like if you've experienced some kind of like big disruption in your life um something's really kind of knocked you like a lot of people might be inclined to say just sort of withdraw and actually sort of sustaining kind of structure in your life can be really kind of protective important as well so just actually thinking well come on now you know normally I'd be going to the gym or normally I'd be meeting up with friends or normally I'd be going like shopping once a week and just doing those things like uh, either creating or continuing to perpetuate structure in your life is just really important. So you aren't having to kind of like, so you still got that in your life, but you aren't having to worry about it as well and plan it. So it's just like these things are still occurring. You know, if I move to a new place and everything's kind of in flux, what are the kinds of things I did before in my life? What are the kinds of things that make me feel better? The kinds of things I used to do and how can I kind of reestablish those? You know, there'd be a little bit of refinement. Maybe I try out the local gym. It's not really my place. So I might try another one later or I might start working out at home or something like that. Then it's just doing those kinds of activities in a kind of a, a very routine way. And routine is important. It kind of like get, it helps get us back on track and it can help get us back on track man, mentally as well. Mm. This concept of routine then, I, I'm wondering if this kind of underlies as well a lot of the reasons maybe migrants. So for example, here in Australia, we have a very multicultural community and what I find particularly like in the city where I live, Sydney, you get a lot of people from, for example, Sri Lanka, which is my background, living in the same parts of Sydney or a lot of Sudanese people you know, congregating in the same parts, Syrian people, right? Some have come from war-torn countries with, you know, real significant, clinically significant trauma. Others, you know, moving for a better life, but in either way, it can be a very stressful time. But, you know, moving to those kind of familiar communities I do wonder whether, you know, there's been any research on how that can help in terms of resilience during a stressful time. If you've got that familiarity, that continuity of, um, you know, cultural, spiritual factors around you. Yeah, definitely. There has been research around that kind of thing that's linked to resilience. And, and like you say, it's, there's various dimensions to that. You know, if you're, um, around others that are a bit like you in some way, maybe there is kind of a, a shared heritage there, then, you know, you've immediately got something in contact. You've immediately got some kind of like community link in a sense there, even if you don't know, uh, you know, a particular individual on a deeply personal basis, you know, there is some kind of like link there, which you think, well, you know, I'm not so kind of alone. I'm not so kind of isolated. Again, even if you don't, ultimately speak to those people strike build up really good friendships it's just having that as a possibility um can reduce that sort of sense of loneliness or isolation which can kind of you know contribute to to, to problems you know related to mental health but engaging in cultural activities is you know you are buffering a kind of a part of your identity there and like i always think that it's particularly important to have a multi-layered identity where 
when one of those things is under threat or under stress, you've got others that kind of like um, buffer you a little bit. So, you know, for instance, for existence, if you're having a tough time at work, you're not just a, you know, a software engineer. You're not just a manager. You're not just uh, whatever it is, you know, a researcher. Um, and likewise, um, if something else is going wrong, kind of in like your personal life or something, there's other kinds of things where you think, well, I'm not a useless individual. I know that I am like a competent cook, or I know that like I am good in this kind of way. So, you know, the more kinds of dimensions you have to your personality that are kind of positive, these more kind of these associations, the more things you can kind of turn to and be reminded of, um, you know, the, these things kind of maybe areas which aren't kind of under threat or stress at the moment. And that's like, that's another thing that I, it's just, it's important to think about the, the limitations and how uh, not all of these sort of areas and domains and protective factors are, in, you know, it's not a, a black and white thing there. Like you can't just say, oh, I have culture in my life and that's going to like sustain me through any kind of adversity. Like you might be living in an area in a community where your culture is restricted in some way, right? Or it's under threat or it's being suppressed or something like that. And that may be kind of a source of stress in itself. Or like, you know, some of our research, we worked with individuals in, um, in, in the Arctic and these First Nations individuals, like some of their kind of um, their cultural ways of working with the land, um, they were being threatened, you know, threatened kind of socially, but threatened environmentally as well. Climate change kind of reducing where the herds are kind of coming down to and things like that. It's like, um, it's, it's, it was obviously very valuable to individuals to be learning these kinds of skills and working with elders in their community to have that kind of link. And that was important to them. But, you know, a related source of stress would be if you weren't able to practice it successfully or like there was something out where you got the sense that you're kind of that way of being was diminishing in some way or there were barriers to that as well. So it's like all of these kinds of like factors that might feed into resilience processes. Um, you just, need, yeah, like I think we've said that you need to think carefully about that kind of interactivity with other things, but it's like can you have too little of something or too much of something um and like is this always going to be accessible to you or is it going to be maybe under threat and you might have to depend on say another kind of protective factor so there's a lot of nuance a lot of like variability it's kind of like you know resilience is such a kind of complex and subject that it's really like it's very situational so whenever you get these kind of like we build resilience universal programs I think you've got to kind of be cautious about those and approach them and say, you know, how is, is this being tailored to my particular situation? And if so, you know, who's doing that and how, how's that working? Cause it's, it's so important to work with individuals to really establish, um, uh, the context and figure out what's important to people, what are their kind of key concerns, what kinds of things do they have in their lives and where, you know, what does resilience look like to them as well? So another important thing is like, you know, resilience is often seen as like overcoming or getting back to something. And it's like, whose standard is that? Are you imposing something on people by saying you've got to have, you know, this level of anxiety? And if you reach that, we'll say that you're a resilient person or you've become resilient or you've overcome something or, you know, you've managed to get yourself in these kind of life circumstances, that's resilience. So there's like, there's a bit of a neoliberal edge to this as well. And it's like, some people will say, well, whose resilience is it? You know, have you actually spoken with us and understood what are the kind of outcomes that we value? You know, what are we trying to kind of establish as our kind of resilience? Like, how can that be demonstrated in a way that like is meaningful to us rather than you just saying, right you know after this disaster you've got a house again so that's resilience isn't it you're like back on your feet and may not be appropriate at all you know there's there's lots of sort of yeah lots of nuance there mm. this is one of the things that i really like about the r2 uh, intervention that i know that you've done a little bit of um, work with and research on is that it, 
so from my i've never come across it before looking at your research so please correct me if my interpretation is wrong but it seems like a, a resilience promoting intervention but that's grounded in individualization and the the very unique context of the individual rather than imposing this is what resilience looks like in every single situation yeah absolutely so i mean the the r2 framework is very broad and the name itself comes from this idea that we are primarily trying to draw attention to the fact that there are these kind of two kinds of protective factors, right? There are these kind of individual characteristics uh, which are modifiable. So it's not like you have them or you don't have them. They can be built. You know, we're talking about things like uh, making meaning, uh, making sense of things, uh, of like um, difficult situations, um, you know, building motivation, uh, things like that. Um, and on the other hand, you've got these more kind of external resources or things that kind of like you might be able to build in your world or that, you know, structural power bases might be able to help you to access. So just trying to make sure there's more of an even split there. That there isn't too much emphasis on, you know, on the one hand, just sorting things out for the individual, very kind of external like um, uh, approach um, or similarly getting away from this traditional perspective where it's like well what can we do in terms of say making you know individuals more mindful um making them more kind of optimistic it's like you know where's the kind of the balance there so the r2 program um that's the sort of the, the gist of it and then within those kind of two streams of factors we have um like a library of all the things that the research has kind of said this is kind of a protective factor and it's been identified as being protective in these kind of contexts and it works in this way. So we've got a, a, you know, a bit of information for each of those things. And what we would do is then when we'd be invited to go into a particular context, like for instance, um, uh, one of our kind of current initiatives is um, supporting individuals in Ukraine um with their who are kind of experiencing you know the conflict over there so individuals who are kind of still living in these not um maybe some of the key conflict areas but still living obviously in a country that is mostly under siege and like you know dealing with some of the, the, the how it's having such a kind of a psychological impact on um on individuals it's like well what can we do there so we'd be invited in to work in that kind of place and say well first of all what what can we learn from the individuals there about what some of the key kind of stresses risks that they're facing are so you know we'll get like a small group of individuals to kind of establish some of the kinds of issues and then say well what are you trying to achieve with this program as well you know is it having good mental health you know or uh, better mental health and, you know, what in particular does that look like? You know, are we trying to say, look at like levels of depression, anxiety, or, you know, are there other aspects to do with well-being, which we're going to kind of establish? Um, and then just sort of working through some of these protective factors and sort of presenting some of these and saying, well, you know, what kind of resonates in um, with you in your kind of context? You know, are some of these factors kind of key? Also, you know what might be working and what might already be taken care of by other organizations there you know you might have um aid organizations that might be supplying some kind of you know um particular resources to particular individuals it's like you don't want to double up there as well so it's like well what might be useful um and we can bring our expertise by saying look we know that in kind of conflict situations that um some of these factors are kind of important you know there's something about kind of like uh knowing that you have kind of an exit plan or something like that which can be kind of useful in certain circumstances and then there'll be other kinds of things and you know it's um that might be useful to kind of promote and then we will kind of like work with those individuals to sort of build a very localized pretty unique program that you know would help to kind of um address the needs of the individuals that are going to use it i love that i love that you know it's a framework that really recognizes yeah the individual and is not paternalistic and i feel like there's still um psychology is moving in the right direction but they're still very 
many paternalistic kind of interventions and approaches, but to see this from a resilience point of view, um, yeah, is, is fantastic. And I'll certainly put a link in the, um, the notes for people who want to kind of find out more. Um, are there kind of any final kind of comments from yourself, Phil? I mean, I know it's such a nuanced topic, like you said, but in the, you know, the short time we've had together, I feel like I, I've learned a lot and it's really changed my, my view of resilience, this conversation and going through your research. But is there anything finally that you want to kind of impart upon um, listeners? Yeah, uh, well, you know, something that kind of comes up a lot for me that I've kind of noticed is that there's a lot of people out there who they, they want to they want to build their resilience. They want to be seen to be resilient, which is obviously completely fair enough. Like it's um, that seems to be the way things kind of are at the moment, the way things are kind of going. You know, let's build our resilience. So you get a lot of these initiatives and they're quite general purpose things as well like you might get universities and other places schools where they say we want our students to be resilient and so we want to bring in these kind of initiatives and these kind of programs because we want to make them resilient um and there's almost like uh a, a narrative there that you want to make people immune and invulnerable and there's it is also important to remember, and I think a lot of people are saying this as well, but I think it's it's important to remember this in the context of resilience and resilience initiatives and interventions that like experiencing problems and, you know, when you experience some kind of adversity and the psychological toll that has on people, like there's a natural kind of impact, like suffering to a certain extent is is normal like people have bad days bad weeks it goes on like it's okay to feel like you aren't kind of coping doing well if it isn't kind of going on forever you know if it, if it isn't having some kind of like serious impact serious ongoing impact on your life when you start to think well you know this isn't really the way that i want my life to be going like there is, um, I think it, it, it's good to kind of remind yourself that like life is full of ups and downs. And like, you know, if you experience something that's particularly stressful, that's going to make you stressed. And just because you might have experienced some kind of resilience intervention or you hear others doing that, it doesn't make people immune to these kinds of things, right? It's like you just it would be good for us to be resilient in the way that like, you know, maybe we're involved in something particularly nasty or something happens and that impacts us, it hits us, we take the knock and it's like, it's bad for us. But then after a while, we want to get better. You know, we want to, to deal with that. We want to cope with that. We may not get over it. Like the death of a family member, you may not ever get over that, but like, you don't want it to have that kind of enduring kind of aspect where it's really dragging down all parts of your life. You know, there's kind of, you're at the level where clinical intervention is required if we're talking about psychological symptoms or your life is just really not going in the direction where you want to kind of eventually start to show that resilience trajectory where you might be kind of like getting back to where you were or you might be getting on get towards a good place as you might see it but like i think just it's that initial kind of impact it's like it's okay you know just you are gonna curl up in bed for a week just okay just if if that's not going to interfere with life too much that's fine you know um so a little bit about the the normalcy of uh um just suffering and having a pretty rubbish time and feeling like you aren't coping is something that I think it's important to remind that that's, that's perfectly fine now and again. Mm. Uh, I, I love that, Phil. Very, very sound advice. Um, yeah, and it's been a very sound conversation. And again, I, I want to just acknowledge that what the work that you're doing, um, it sounds like it's having a, a really profound impact on, on many lives. And one thing I didn't share with you is that it's actually changed my own practice um, as a clinician in the way that I look at resilience with my own clients. Um, I'm certainly coming at it from less of a paternalistic point of view and also looking at the environmental, their their resources in their life. How can we help them to reach out for help as well in and around them? Um, so, yeah, in the short time I've come across your work, it's had a profound impact on me. So thank you, Phil. 
Well, that's great to hear, Andy. Like, I think that's, you know, it is, it's so important as well. And like you said, it's like, what can people connect with? And what do they feel that they can connect with as well, like reasonably? You can say like, oh, there's a mental health service down the road. You know, it's only down the road. Like, what's wrong with you? Why can't you go in down there? And it's like, well, if it's not right for that person, if it's not truly accessible to them, like, then it isn't right. And like, what else is there as well? You know, what are these kind of like small other things that we can sort of connect with in our lives um, that might be being put out there as well, but might just be available as well, like places we can go to, like small little changes as well. 